here on Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Uh, before we start, I wanted to just give you guys some, uh, some quick updates on tomorrow. So tomorrow, typically at New Hope, uh, we have our Sunday morning service from 9 to 11, and then Sunday night from 6 to 8. And for those of you guys that have probably been attending for a while, you guys know that this is the third Sunday night of, uh, of the month, which is called New Harvest Night. And that's where we invite everybody to bring all of their, their non-Christian friends, um, your neighbors, people from work, people from school. And um, tomorrow we're going to have a great, great message again from Brian. So in the morning, if you want to bring your kids along for this, uh, from 9 to 10 in our Sunday school, uh, we're going to have a science lesson for kids. Brian's going to be talking about fossils. So, uh, or if you want to be there as well with the kids, you can join. Okay, we won't stop you. Um, and from 10 to 11, and this will be in Mackenzie Hall, um, we're going to have the talk on the ultimate proof of creation, as Brian already alluded to. And then in the evening service from uh, 6 to 8, the first part we're going to have uh, just some worship and some specials. And then from 7 to 8, Brian's going to do his last talk on evolution, fact, or fiction. And that's where Brian's going to be going into a little more, more detail, especially for the non-believing community who some like evidence, some don't. They want to disprove everything, but Brian's going to be doing a, a talk on fact or fiction. So, um, Brian, you ready? Chapter 2 and 3? Awesome. The question is, are you ready? <laughs> you know, when God created Adam, he was looking for a companion for Adam. He went to Adam and he said, Adam, I'm going to make you a helpmate, a companion. This person is going to love you forever. They're going to wait hand and foot on you. They're going to make you a king and put you up on a pedestal. And always listen to you and do everything you say. And all it's going to do is cost you an arm and a leg. And Adam thought about it for a while. And he says, what can I get for a rib? And that's not we have women that we have today. I thought you might not know that. Go look for it in Scripture. So we had finished up there with Genesis 1 and part of here. The first uh, three verses of chapter 2. Because I said they kind of went together. And now here in chapter 2, God is going to talk in more detail about creating Adam and Eve. And what happened on that second day of creation. So it says here in verse 4 of Genesis 2, it says, This is the account. And that word account in Hebrew means generation. In fact, that's where we get the word Genesis from. It means generation. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created when? In the day God made the earth. In the heavens. So what it's doing is, you'll notice it's called a Toledoth, and you'll notice that in other parts of Scripture here, the Toledoth is given there by the person or the patriarch who's identified with writing that passage. Well, who would have wrote the passage of Genesis one? Who was there? God. So He wrote this, and He, you know, later on got it to uh, Moses so that Moses could write Genesis. It says, now here in verse 5, this is very important to understand what's going on. It says, now no shrub of the field. Now a shrub of the field means those kind of plants that you would plant. And what's God saying here, there's no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. So with God, he created all the vegetation, but now he's going to do something special, and he's going to plant a garden in a certain part of the earth, and it's called the Garden of Eden, and this is where he was going to put the first man and the first woman. So this was special. It goes here in verse 6, but he says, No rain had come, but a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. This is why I believe there was no rain on the earth, until the rains of the flood came. How did God water the earth? It says he used the mist coming out of the ground to water the earth. That's what it says. 
And then verse 7 says, The Lord had formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So what it's now doing is telling you more, give more information how Adam was created. It says here, the Lord had formed man of the dust. You know, it's very interesting when we use science and we, when we look at the elements that man is created of, there are all the elements that we find in the ground. All the elements that we find in the earth. So science backs up what the Bible says here. He was formed from the dust of the ground. And what did God breathe? He breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, I told you plants have a body. And I told you that animals have a body and a soul. And a soul also means their conscience of being alive. They have, they have, they, they think and they know that they're living. And that's what it is. That's what animals have. That's why they're special. They have a soul. And so does man. But what did God give man that animals don't have? A spirit. This is what it says. He breathed the breath of life into it. And man become a living being. This is man's spirit. And the difference between animals and man, that the spirit that man has is able to commune with God. He's able to have fellowship with God. My dog doesn't have fellowship with God. Also, we were given the ability of morals. We could choose good and bad, and right and wrong. <laughs> animals don't do that. That's why animals are innocent. And maybe why God used them as the first uh, creatures that were killed for sin. To pass over the sin of Adam and Eve. So maybe that's why. But we animals have, I mean, plants have bodies, animals have a body and soul. Man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Verse 8 The Lord planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and he placed the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight, good for food, and the tree of life. In the midst of the garden, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, these were real trees with real fruit on them. And probably the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was also. Notice it talks about the tree of life. Well, it talks a lot about the tree of life later on in Revelation. The tree of life was in the garden. And they gave, gave life. That's why it, it, after and he fell, they were prevented from accessing that tree for whatever reason. Verse 10 says, And now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. Now you've got to remember something. This Eden and the rivers that were on the earth at the time, even though some of them may have the same names as rivers we have today, the problem is during the flood, the entire earth was destroyed. None of that stuff was around, including, I believe, the Garden of Eden. It was all destroyed. But these words we use for rivers here, some of these are old, ancient river names. And that's why they're given here even today in Minneapolis. But I don't believe that they're the same rivers. And it says that the name of the first is the Phison. It flows around the whole earth in the land of, excuse me, the land of Helva, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. And the Delium, which is a, it's a, it's a um, precious resin, you know, kind of like what myrrh was. And it says, 13, the name of the second river is the Simon, and it flows around the whole land of Cush. And Cush is the name that was given later. We got the name Ethiopia later. So even though it may be there, doesn't mean that's where it was. We have no idea where the Garden of Eden was. But I, you could say it was in that Mideast area. It could be, I don't know. Nobody knows. It's not there anymore, I can tell you that. Verse 14, it says, The name of the third river is the Tigris. It flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. So, I don't believe that these rivers that we have today, the Euphrates and Tigris, that this is the same river. They have the same names, because those names are names of ancient rivers. So. But who knows? Nobody knows that. Nobody was there except Adam and Eve, your God. Verse 15, this is, The Lord took the man, and he put him in a garden. And the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Guess what, guess what Adam was given? The job. So man was designed to work from the very beginning. 
But you got to know something. Since that time, man failed, and God greatly increased the work that's needed to do certain things. You could say he made the hill steeper. But back then, Adam was supposed to work. He had a job, and it was going to be not hard to do the things he was supposed to do. Verse 16 says, The Lord commanded the man, saying, From every tree of the garden you may eat what? Freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. You see, Adam and Eve, they hadn't sinned. They hadn't sinned yet. Now, God created man so that he had freedom. He had freedom to choose. And with freedom to choose, there comes a danger. There comes a danger that they could have chosen the wrong thing. Now, God is giving them a command. He says, you can eat every tree in the garden, all you want, freely. But for the knowledge, tree from the knowledge of, of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you do, you will what? Sure. There's no question about it. When that happens, you're going to die. That word, die, in the Hebrew has a combination of meaning die and you shall die. What's the two types of death in the world for man? Physical death and spiritual death. Spiritual death is hell. And hell literally, biblically, means separation from God for eternity. All the things that God is, and all those fruits of the Spirit that you read about in Scripture, God is love, He's good, there's, there's friendship, and all these things that God is. That's, that's what hell is, eternal separation from God. He was saying to Adam, if you do this, you're going to be spiritually dead, and because of that, because of life, if you're separated from me sooner or later, you're going to physically die. And that's what happened. Adam lived for how long? It says 930 years after he, after he was born. Or created more actually. By the way, how are you going to be able to tell Adam when you're in heaven? What do you say? No belly button? Yes. <laughs> By the way, you know what the four types of birth are? You should know that, right? First, Adam was what? Created. And what was the word by Eve? She was what? Formed from the man. That's two types. What's the third type? Virgin birth. Right? That only, all those three things happen only one time. And the fourth is what? How everybody else is born. Normally it's a woman. Those are the four types of birth. So you should be able to figure that out in the scripture to do that. Alright, so now he says, don't eat from that tree. Now, did Adam understand what he was talking about? Did God give command to Adam that Adam wouldn't know what he was talking about? No. Adam knew that. He said he didn't know what evil was yet. But if you, did you ever do something, or you didn't do something, and you saw something happen, or you looked at something, and he says, I don't like that. I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> All right? You may not experience it, but you know, you look at it, and then I don't want that to happen. I think this is how Adam kind of knew it, too. God told him, if you do this, bad things are going to happen. And I think he knew, I knew he knew exactly what God was saying. Die, and you will die. Verse 18, this is the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, it says after God created things, he said it was, was good. But at the end of the creation, he said it was very good, exceedingly good. So up to now, the creation was very good. And Adam was a perfect creation. But God had more in store for Adam. And he says, he didn't want Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make him a helpmate. And this word helpmate or helper, in Hebrew it means big help. It's the same word used with David and the people, the generals and the, and the, the soldiers that served David. That kind of help, immense help, that's what this word means. Adam, I'm going to make you a helpmate that's going to give you immense help in your life. So it says here, God did something first, so that Adam understood what he was talking about. Verse 19 says, 
Out of the ground, the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky. He's talking about God had created all these creatures before on day five and day six. That's what he's talking about here. And every bird of the sky, he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Now notice, this is the beast of the field and every bird of the sky. He can bring Adam every creature on the earth. He can bring all those squishy fishes either. He brought, you know, animals to the field. Those were the animals that were around and close to Adam. So Adam had no problem giving all these animals names in a few hours. And Adam was smart. He was the smartest man that ever lived. So he was smart. He knew he had, that's why he had language and he could talk to God and he could do this type of thing. To the man, to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, those with net fishes, not the plants, that's what his name was. Verse 20, the man gave names to all the cattle, and to all the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Lord, Lord used this word twice, suitable. What he was going to do is Adam had to realize there was not a creature. Here's Adam looking at the animals with a name. Yeah, male and female, yeah, male and female, male and female, male. You know, he had to realize what God was going to do here. And God was going to make a helper for him that was suitable. He wasn't going to go around with an elephant. He had to go something that was like him, suitable for him. That's what God was going to do. So what's the first thing Adam does? He goes to sleep. Right? So God more caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept. And he, that is God, took one of his ribs, some verses use sides or whatever. I kind of think the interpretation of a rib fits, and I'll tell you why. And he closed up the flesh at that place. Now notice what God took out of Adam. He took flesh and what? Bone. These were two things that God took to form the woman. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. So at Eve was not created like Adam was. She was formed out of man. Adam went to sleep complete, and he woke up incomplete. Bear that in mind. Now, you want to know how we got the word woman? God bought this beautiful, beautiful female creature to Adam. And when Adam took a gander at her, he said, Whoa, man. <laughs> right? That's how we got a woman. I don't know, I would have said, I said, Yes! You know? Or you would say, Dog! Don't sound as well as it works. <laughs> so that's how we got the word woman. No, that's not the scripture. That's just not. So, he, so Adam went to sleep. God took this flesh and bone from his side. He formed a woman and he brought her to the man, Adam. This was going to be his helpmate. So what did Adam say? And this is why he says it. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It's kind of a second self. And for this cause, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one in the flesh. This part of scripture is the basis for the Jews in their marriage ceremonies and all that. That's basically what God, what Jesus was talking about at the Last Supper when he did this. They said, what are you talking about? You know, because this is what kind of things that they did. And when he brought man... I mean, the woman to the man, he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And for this cause, remember I told you over here, Jesus was quoting that? Jesus quoted from Genesis 127 and 224, those verses. Jesus accepted what was being taught in Genesis 1 and 2 as true and literal. And this is why, this is why we know that marriage is between one man and one woman. And I'll tell you why. I told you that Adam went to sleep complete. When he woke up, he was incomplete. And what did God give him? He gave him woman, which was taken out of him. 
So now he's what? Complete again. This is why marriage does not work between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. It don't work. Because God created marriage between a man and a woman because man was incomplete and with a woman he's complete. He's not complete with another man. And neither is woman. So God instituted marriage here in Genesis between one man and one woman for life. And that's what he did. Now verse 25 says, And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. This word used here for wife in Hebrew, it means a female person. There is no such thing as homosexual marriage in the scriptures. It's between a man and a woman, and that's how God created marriage, for the reasons that I gave you. And it says here, The man and woman were both naked, and they were not ashamed. There was no shame in the world at the time because there was no sin. And God here, at the end of that chapter 1, He looks down on the earth after He created woman, and that's when He stopped saying it was good. That's when He said it was very good, that it was exceedingly good. Everybody got that? Yeah. Okay. So that's the end of chapter 2, and that was just kind of an overview of what happened on the sixth day, the creation of woman and the institute of marriage that God gave. Now you know where marriage come, comes from. And that's why it should only be between for a man and a woman, because that's the way God designed it. But now we're going to have a problem here in chapter 3. Okay, we're going to get the bad news. Now I told you that Adam and Eve were created perfect, in a perfect world, where they were given only the plants to eat, and so were the animals. Prior to the fall of man, according biblically, there was no death in the world. Because what does Romans 6.23 tell us about sin? The wages of sin are what? Death. You know what that word wage means? It's something you earn. So the wage of sin, which you earn from sinning, is death. Not only spiritual death, separation from God, but it's also talking about and implies physical death. Because God is life. If you're separated from God, you're not going to have life anymore. That's what it talks about. So now we're going to talk about what happened in the garden. Now people say, they asked me before, what about uh, the angels? When, they were, when did they come into being? Well, I believe the angels were created with the creation. They're created beings. The only uncreated being I know of is God. They were all created beings like us. They're spiritual beings, but they're created. And if you look in Job, it talks about that the sons of God, the morning stars, you know, sang when God laid the foundation of the earth. So they were there. He laid the foundation there in the first couple of years, the second day of the earth. So he laid the foundation. They were there. And they were rejoicing. So they were at the beginning of the creation. And they were all through this creation. And they say, well, yeah, but then I know that Satan fell at some point, didn't he? Yeah. To me, when I read Genesis 1, it says God looked down on his creation. That means everything in the universe. And saw that was very good, exceedingly good. I believe there was no sin at all in the universe. Satan or otherwise. I believe Satan had to fall after, after the creation was done. It could have been the morning after, the day after. I have no idea. You say, well, how long did it take for Adam and Eve to fall? Same thing. I don't think it was very long. Personally, it could have been days or a week or two. Why do I say that? Because what did God tell Adam and Eve to do right away? After he created them. Rule the earth and what? Starts with an end. Multiply. Now, they lived in what God said. What does it mean multiply? Go have kids. Now, the first kid that was born was who? Cain. Was he born in sin or out of sin? He was born in sin. So I don't think it happened very long after the fall. I mean, after the creation. The Satan fell, and then probably right away he came to see Eve. Now, he might have went to see Adam first. I don't know. It doesn't say anything about that. But he came to Eve. He sensed that he could probably get further with her first. And that's all it took. 
So now we're going to talk about the fall of man. It says here in verse 3, now the serpent. That's the word we get to get snake, and it means a shiny, upright thing. Who knows what a snake looked like before the fall? You know, after the fall, when God cursed the snake, he, uh, the snake says, you're going to be on your ground and on your stomach, but maybe at that time the snake was a creature that with a strong skeleton, it could have stood up. I have no idea. But it was very interesting that he didn't see any problem with the snake standing up and talking to her. You say, would well, you mean animals talk back then? I don't know. You know, maybe something happened to the animals. Maybe they could communicate in some kind of fashion. I don't know. I have no idea. All we know is that, uh, that she didn't see any problem with talking to a snake. And maybe she hadn't seen everything in the garden yet, and she had no idea it was all in the world. She didn't see a problem with that. That's basically what I think was more likely. She didn't see a problem with the snake talking because she hadn't seen anything, everything yet, so to speak. So it's now serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. So this seems to be, you know, a pretty smart snake, which the Lord God had made. And he, that is the snake. And so the people say, well, how do you know this was Satan? Well, if you go back into a few places in Scripture, you know, back into Revelation, I think it's 12, 2, John makes it very clear that this was a serpent of old. Satan was a serpent of old. And this was Satan, you know, embodying the serpent itself. This was actually Satan himself. After his fall, after his, you know, he fell, it's told us in Scripture that he came to the woman for whatever reasons. And he said to the woman, there is no God. Did he say that? No. Why? Because he was crafty. And that dog wouldn't hunt, as we say that. You know, this wouldn't work to say something like that. So he was crafty. What did the first thing he do to the Eve? He asked her a question. He didn't give her a statement or anything. He asked her a question. He says, he said to Eve, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? See, he formed it as a question. So he was trying to deceive Eve and lead her down a path, and that's what he was trying to do. And some of the things Satan uses, he uses the truth mixed with lies. He just doesn't tell full lies. He uses part of the truth, as you see here, and he uses parts lies. He, you know, he twists them together. He puts a little twist on the truth. And that has worked very well from that day until this very day we see here. That's how he gets away with his lies. He fixes a little bit of truth with them. In fact, those are the best lies that work. Those who are mixed with truth. So has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now what should he have done right here? She said, less, right? She didn't want she to say anything because what's he talking about? He didn't say that. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, this is the Satan. He says, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. What did she leave out? He says, we may eat. What did God say they could do? Freely eat. You notice she does two things here. She leaves out God's word and she adds to God's word. Both will get you in big trouble. And God says that. So she says, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. She left out freely. But she says, from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it, or touch it, or you will die. Now, is that what God said? What did he say about touching it? He didn't say anything. So she added that. What did God say? Don't eat of it. But she said, don't touch it. It says, from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. Notice, she didn't even say what kind of tree it was. She said, oh, it's out there in the middle of the garden. She was getting in trouble. She should have left. From the fruit of the tree, which is the middle of the he said, You shall not eat from it or touch it. That's where she added. Or you will what? Die. And she left out what? Surely die. So she added to God's word and she took away from God's word. She's already had it down here fast. This is how Satan was working his, his jobs. Verse 4 says, The serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not. Now, what was Satan doing here? He was calling God a liar. That's what he was doing. He framed it very nicely. He says, you don't surely die. What did God tell him? You will 
more surely die. He was calling God a liar. That's what he was doing. Satan does that well all the time. He says, you surely won't die. Why? For God knows that at the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Did he say what was true? Would it open their eyes? Yeah. Would they know the difference between good and evil? Yeah. Would they be as God? No. You know, that's the biggest lie that Satan tells to everybody. You'll be like God. Isn't that why we have all these different kinds of religions that believe in that men are like God and that we can make God ourselves or become God ourselves by what we believe or what we do? You know, that's, you see, that's the problem with a lot of religions that are false is that we add stuff to God's Word to make it work our way, and we take things away from God's Word. And that's why people, in a lot of things, can get very legalistic. We try to add, you know, if God makes the fence here, say out here, we try to move the fence closer to us. You know, we figure if we add more to God's Word, it'll work better. It doesn't work better. God gives us a limit, and we try to make limits that are closer to us. God says, don't do that. Don't add to the word and don't take it away. But that's what a lot of religions have done. False religions is they add to God's word. You know, another thing they give you in here that says, you know, if you do this special thing, you'll get secret special knowledge. And that's another thing they do. They add to God's word. If you do this thing in our religion, you're going to get that special knowledge that you need. God says, no, all the knowledge that you need is this book right here. You know, if you want to know something is true, positively, if you read it in this book, I guarantee you it's true. Outside this book, we don't know for sure. But God's Word is true. Now look what he even did. She didn't even do this. Verse 6, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was the light to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate now that's bad. You know, if you look in 1 John 2.16, it talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's exactly what three things Satan hit her with this right here, with this tree of life. She said it was good, the light to the eyes, the tree was desirable, the tree was the light to the eyes, and good for food, which was the, good for food was the flesh, you know. And it says, the light to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from the fruit and ate, and also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And this is the saddest part of all scripture that I know of. This was the fall of man. Because they rejected what God said, and decided that they could trust truth, or decide truth by themselves instead of trusting God. You know, that's, what, that's why Satan was able to do what he did with Eve. Because he led her down the path saying, you know what? God is not telling you something. He's leaving something out. He doesn't have your best interest in mind. And if you do this, maybe you should just see for yourself. And that's how he tempted Eve. That's what she says later. That's what he did. And God agrees. That's what he did. And it says, when he ate, now was Adam with her during this whole time? Maybe. Maybe maybe the serpent had come all the way to Adam first and tried to work this, and it didn't work, so he went to Eve, and it worked, and then she went and drew her husband into it. And that's what happened. And they both fell. But God blames Adam because what? He was dominion. He's what they call the federal head of the human race. Every human being has come from Adam. Every one of them. So he was ahead. So when he fell, the whole human race fell. And that's why we're all born in sin and why we need a Savior. You know, people will think, well, if I do enough good things, I can get to heaven. My question is, what happens if you do one less than the number you need? You know, I mean, that's the problem with that. It says, verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin covered. Notice what they did. When they sinned, they decided, you know what, we've got to fix this ourselves. 
That's works. That's what the first thing, that's what a lot of people are trying to do. Hey, I'm good enough. I can get into heaven. No, you can't. Who are you comparing yourself to? The guy next door or God? In order to do God, you've got to be perfect. But it says here, they tried to make money things for themselves, but they saw they were naked. What does it say there at the end of chapter, at the chapter 2? Excuse me, chapter 2, yeah. He says they were naked, but and they feel no shame. But all of a sudden, after they sinned and disobeyed God, they say they were naked, and they get themselves fig leaves, cover themselves up. You know what the problem with fig leaves are? When they dry out, they get crispy. See, they tried to do the job themselves and it didn't work. Now we come what we call the judgments. Now God is going to come and face to face with them with what they did. Verse 8 it says here in chapter 3 of Genesis, it says, And they heard the sound of God walking in the garden and cool the day. He said, Was God walking in the garden? Yeah, I believe he was. I think this is probably the pre incarnate Christ. This happened numerous times in Scripture. Remember who came to visit Abraham? I think it was a pre incarnate Christ with a couple of the angels with him. So I believe this was God walking in the garden with him. He, maybe this is something they did all the time, every day, that God was walking in the garden. And when he heard God walking in the garden, it says the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now they weren't good at this hiding thing. Can you think that you're going to be able to hide from God behind a tree? I don't think so. Verse 9 says, The God called to the man, he who said to the woman, to him, Where are you? Now, could God find them? Yeah. What had happened now between Adam and God? They were like this. All of a sudden, what did sin do? It separated. God knew where he was. He was trying to get Adam to talk to realize what they had done. And Adam realizes too, they no longer had that fellowship with God that he had since he was created. So now God says, hey Adam, where are you? And he said, this is Adam, verse 10, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Now, if he was hiding from God, he's not very good at this, right? When he comes out and works out. What's going on? Where he was? Verse 11 says, And he said, that's God, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? So he was, he was asking, you know, he didn't come out and drop the hammer on him, did he? You know, bam, bam, bam. He wanted them to realize what they had done. That's why I believe he was asking these questions. What have you done? Why do you know you're naked? Did you eat from that tree I told you not to eat? What did Adam say? The man said, That woman who you gave to me, okay, she gave to me and I ate. This is what we call the blame game. Who is God blaming for all this? God! This is that woman you gave me. You see, I have not realized a little bit before this, he was in deep trouble because when he put the fig leaves on, when he heard his wife say, these fig leaves make me fat. <laughs> you see, he already knew he was in deep trouble. <laughs> then they get crispy. Then he really had problems. So he says, it was that woman that you gave me. He said, I'm blaming. He's blaming God. He's blaming God for his problems. I think a lot of us do that, still do that today, don't we? You blame God. So Adam, right away, boom, knew how to, you know, set blame. I have a question for those who have kids. Do you have to teach your kids to lie? No, it just comes naturally, don't it? Well, after Adam failed, he had no problem, you know, blaming people and starting over what he had to do. It started the blame game. He blamed God. Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman. So now Adam blamed God, so now he's going to turn to the woman. He says, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. You know, she was honest. She was honest. Adam says, you know, it's because all these things that people did to me and all the stuff that happened, and when they were done doing all they did to me, then I ate. You know, the woman was honest there. She says, hey, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She came right out with it. In other words, it's still saying both of them, especially Adam said he was the victim. We had a lot of that today, don't we? I'm the victim. 
Verse 14, the Lord said to the serpent, said, look to the man, then he went down to the woman, now he turns to the serpent. He doesn't ask the serpent any questions. He says, because you have done this. And who's he talking to here, really? Satan. Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, and more of all than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and thus you shall eat all the days of your life. That doesn't mean the serpent's going to eat dust. But if this creature was some standing upright, shiny creature, now it's going to spend its life on the ground. And that's where it's going to live and get its food. And that's what it means to do this type of thing. Verse 15. And this is really important. It says, I will put enmity between you, that's Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now, what does it mean that Satan has seed? No, he's what? What kind of being? He's a spiritual being. He doesn't have seed. And women don't have seed either. Men have seed. So that's what that is. So that's what that is. But what did he mean by here? Well, he's talking about those who follow Satan and those who follow God. And he's going to put enmity. What does that mean? Hate. He's going to put hate between you. I want to put that hate between you and yours, those that follow you, and between the woman and those who follow God, her seed. And to the woman, he said something like, well, then he goes on to say, he shall bruise you on the head. That's the seed of the woman. Who are we talking about here? Jesus Christ and all those who follow him. Between Jesus Christ, he shall bruise you on the head. When you get bruised on the head, that can usually be a mortal wound. He says, I'm going to put an end to what you do, Satan. My, my son is going to do this, the seed of the woman. And you shall bruise him on the heel. He's talking about the crucifixion. You know, I think Satan was one of the happiest creatures in the whole universe when Christ died on the cross. He had no idea what was happening. You know, when Christ died on the cross, because he suffered for our sins, that was the best thing that ever happened to us in this world. Because of that, he paid for our sins on that cross. I don't think Satan had any idea what was going on. He was just happy that the Son of God died on the cross. I don't think any conception was going to happen because of that. To do this. He'll bruise you, you'll bruise him on the hill. It's not going to be a mortal wound. He's going to come back again. Verse 16, he says, And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and childbirth. Now, probably, when it says greatly multiply, that means there was some kind of sensation or feeling when, when women had, or were going to have, you know, babies before they fell, though they didn't have any. And it says, in your pain you shall bring forth children, which is what we see today, don't we? Yet your desire shall be for your husband. You, you, you won't want to rule over your husband, you're going to want your husband to rule over you. You're going to have that desire to do that. So he cursed Satan, and he told the woman what was going to happen because of what she did, and now he turns to the man. And in these things that he's telling, you know, Satan and, and Adam and Eve, there are consequences of what they did. You know, Christ died for our sins, and he even took some of the consequences that happened because of our sin. But even though our sin is paid for, there's always consequences in the world for what we do. But all the things, all the injustice in the world are going to be taken care of in three ways. One, they're taken care of in this life. Or two, they're taken care of, um, you know, at the great white throne judgment. There's two times that they do this. And another time is when um, people, what happens during their life, that they, whatever they do cause consequences, those are going to be taken, sometimes we have to suffer those consequences. But they're going to be taken care of sometime in this life or sometime at the Great White Throne Judgment. All injustices are going to be corrected one day to do that. So he turns to Adam and he says, Behold, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Now this is one time Adam should listen to his wife, right? He should have done that. And you have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. What does God do? He's going to curse, he curses the creation. 
He curses the ground. He curses the universe. He curses the ground because of you and told you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. Now, as I told you, I don't, I don't think thistles and thorns existed in the creation, although those kind of plants that they came from did. But God caused a lot of changes in the creation because He cursed the creation. That's why, how do we know what mosquitoes and bacteria and viruses were before the creation? Now, a lot of those things are bad. You know, there's people say, well, yeah, they had to eat other things other than plants, because look at the Look at what lions eat, you know, the big teeth that they have and all that. Well, just because you have big teeth doesn't mean you've got to eat meat. Sometimes you need those teeth to be able to eat melons and things like that. I know a lion that all it ate was melons. That's all it ate. But something changed. God caused the, the, the creation that he had in the genes. He put that capability for those things to happen because did God know that Adam and Eve were going to fall? Yeah. They say, well, why did God go through all this? Why didn't he create this perfect world, put these guys in here that are perfect, and then expect them to be perfect? He knew that if he gave them a choice, what was going to happen? They were going to fall. He knew all that. What does it say that Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain when? Before the foundation of the world. God knew all this was going to happen, so why did he do it? You know, Revelation tells us, 11.4, that God created the uh, creation for his own will and his own good pleasure. He wanted to do it. He wanted to have fellowship with the creature on the, uh, the level that he could have fellowship from. He knew this was going to happen. You say, well, why did he do all that? Why couldn't he program Adam and Eve alone? Like a robot, or automaton. Let me ask you a question. When you want somebody to love you, whether it's your kids, or a spouse, or whatever. What kind of love do you like from them? Is the love that you stick a knife in the ribs and say, you're going to love me? Or is it the love they love you because they want to? You see, in order to be free, you have to have the choice to do either. To love someone or not love someone. And I believe God did this because He gave Adam and Eve the ability to be free to love because they want to love. And this is why he gave them the choice. But God knew that it was going to happen, and he knew that he was going to take that penalty of their sin on himself and take it, all the sins on that cross. And he, he knew that he would do it. And that's why he did it, because he knew it. He, he gave himself for what we did. Don't we have an awesome God to do that? And this is where I believe he cursed, you know, the entire universe. That's why we have supernovas, we have suns exploding, we have meteors and comets hitting other planets that we see in our solar system. All this stuff happened since the fall. All this stuff happened. I don't believe there was any craters on the moon before the fall. God created everything perfect. The reason we get all this chaos now is because God cursed the universe. And that's why it's all falling apart. That's why suns as we think, because we've never been around long enough to really know that they die, and we think that's what causes supernovas, that they explode and do that type of thing. That you eat of all the days of your life, the thorns and thistles shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your face, and it says here in verse 19, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust. And thus you shall return. That's physical death. So they died spiritually, as you can see all the responses they gave to God. And what did God say is going to happen to them? They're going to die. Adam took 930 years to die, but he dies. And that's why you hear in the Bible when you read those genealogies, it says, Yeah, this is born, this is born, and then they what? They died. They all died. Two things my grandfather told me that always are going to happen death and taxes. You're always going to have those for Verse 20, Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Now remember what they had done to cover their sin. They tried to do their own. They tried to do their own works. And it was going to work. 
This is what God does. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. This is the first recorded event of an animal dying. What was God doing? What did he do? He covered their sin. This is what he was going to do in the law with the Jews. He was going to use, you know, the uh, sacrifice of an animal to cover their sin, but not to pay for it. But he says, you know, in order to pay for sin, you got to have the blood. This is what he's doing. This was a, a type. You see, Adam was a type of Christ. And Eve was a type of the church. And that was a marriage between Adam and Eve, is what he talks about. And God talks about the marriage relationship between Christ and the church. These were all types that God talks about. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. What's the problem of doing that? Why was God, why was God, why did he say this? He said, now they know good and evil. And he's saying they've basically fallen. They're living in sin. They're separated from God. What's the problem of living forever? Yeah, they live forever. What? Dead. If they did that, they'd live forever in that state and they could never die, you know? And Christ, being a man, wouldn't have been able to die either. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are very important here. It talks about that deep. But God says, hey, he's, you'll, you'll never die. And God would want them forever living in that dead state. He wanted them to be able to one day pay for their sins and free them from the sin that, they was, that had caused them to do what they did. Verse 23, Therefore God sent him out of the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. He didn't want them to live forever in a state of death and alienation. So he kicked them out of the garden. Verse 24, So he drove the man out at the east of the garden of Eden, and he stationed the cherubim. Cherubim is one of the highest angels there are. There are angels who guard, guard God's holiness. And he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Now that's what happened in the beginning of the world. Now you had God creating the world and the universe and why he did it and what happened each day. And he talks about the creation of man and his partner, his helpmate woman, which they need to be together to make one complete person. And then you see what happened with the fall, which chapter 3 probably the saddest chapter of all scripture. That man was given the freedom to choose God or choose what he wanted. And man failed, deciding he could determine truth better than God could. And we all do that today. But God had a plan, didn't he? He had a plan. See, this is why you have to explain people why you need the Savior. Because you can't do it yourself. You've got to be able to have someone who was completely sinless, and that's what Christ, when he was born into the form of man, he was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. And he was perfect, he never sinned. Can you imagine being the brother of Jesus and this kid never doing anything wrong? Can you imagine that? But that's what he did, he was perfect. He never sinned, he was sinless. And that's why he was able was to talk the Lamb of God that he could take away the sins of the world. That's why it works. You could not have a man or any man do it. It had to be a man who had never sinned. And there's never been a man born or created that's ever done that except who? Jesus Christ. Amen, brothers and sisters? So I hope I was able to give you some good information. I'm glad you came here today. I hope tomorrow you can come to the service where I can show you how to witness to people and also to the evening service where you can also I give you some good scientific evidence that, that show that the Bible teaches, they back up the Bible, they give you truth, and show that if a friend of mine said once, he says, whatever you read in God's Word, you should find in God's world. And I'll show you tomorrow what that means. Amen? Thank you, folks.